Welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is 12 o'clock on a Sunday and it's time for a Q&A. This is where I take several questions uh, that have been asked over the course of the week and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. First of all, thank you so much for you guys that support the channel and keep supporting the channel. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of hard work putting Magic TV together, but as long as there's people that want to listen to it and watch the videos, then I will carry on doing it. Anyway, if I haven't got to your video or your question even this week, I apologise greatly. Uh, I sometimes miss the questions. This is currently being filmed on Wednesday. Uh, if you've asked it after Wednesday, I've missed it, in which case I apologise. Please ask it in the comments to this video and I will get back to it next week. Anyway, without further ado, we've got a whole bunch of questions. I've had to flip through. There's a lot this week. So without further ado, let's get straight into this week's questions. So the first question is from Sean Goff and Sean says, great video, thanks very much. Uh, I recently bought The Advocate by Daniel Madison, which is a brilliant index and wondering, do you use a card index for any of your tricks? And if so, what tricks do you use an index for and what's your favourite use for one? Yes, I do. Um, I could never get on with The Advocate. It was just something that I, um, I kind of really struggled with. It was something that just didn't work for me. Uh, but I know that a lot of people love it. Uh, there's two indexes that I use all the time. The first is the index that's coming out through Murphy's Magic via Lloyd Barnes and Javier Fuenmajor. I was very lucky to get a very early version of this uh, of this index, and it is incredibly fast. I think the most important thing when you're talking about index is the speed that you can actually reach into your pocket and take the card out. If you guys don't know what an index is, by the way, that's what it is. It's a way of keeping cards somewhere like your pocket so that you can reach in and take the desired card out very, very easily. Uh, and Lloyd's index, Lloyd and Javier's index, does that in about three seconds with no fumbling. So I use that for a couple of different ways. Uh, I use it in the quantum deck to have a any card at any number. And it's my favorite way of doing any card at any number with the quantum deck. So I show the deck uh, as being blank on both sides. I put it down on the table and I have someone name a card. So they name a card. Once they've named a card, I reach into my pocket and I, I, I gesture to somebody else and I say, can you name a number for me? And I go through that and as they do, I get the card. And uh, and as as I and I I timed it so that in the script for this particular presentation, as I say, you know, you can pick any number. There's 52 cards in the deck. As I say that, I bring the cards back and I gambler's cop load the card onto the bottom of the quantum deck. Then I can very easily get that into position. So when they've named the number, uh, you know, I can get that into position so that I can do an, any card at any number with a blank deck using the quantum deck. The other way that you can actually do this uh, very very easily is by uh, just literally as an opener in a walk around set. It makes a great opener. If you've got an index that's quick enough, it makes a great opener. So you can just literally uh, walk up to people with a deck of cards and you can have somebody uh, name a card. Uh, what card would you like to name? You can name any card that you want to and they name a card and uh, you go watch and you've got the deck and you snap your fingers, you go one card's jumped into my pocket. Check it out, seriously, one card from the pocket, from the deck into the pocket, what was your card? Nailed it. And it, the perception is that it's jumped from the deck into the pocket, um, which obviously hasn't happened. I then cut that card into the deck. And as I go into my pocket for a pen, I put it back into position. So that's a nice use for it as well. The other uh, index that I use is I use the index that comes with uh, Christian Grace's Switch One. Now, I love this index. I love the fact that it's a wallet. If you don't know the index that comes with Switch One, you can basically open it up. It looks like a wallet. You can open it up and you can take something out of it. And as you do, you get uh, you can get a folded up card into position. So Christian uses it for his amazing Switch One routine and he has it open over his jacket pocket. So he has someone name a card. He's got a folded up card there. Um, he reaches in and gets the relevant card into position and he does the switch and she shows he's got the correct card. I do something a little bit different and I've never shared this with anyone. So this is kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a special bonus for you guys, maybe or something like that. What I do is I combine the index on switch one with um, um, Wayne Dobson's um, version of the invisible deck. So in the Wayne Dobson invisible deck, basically the whole idea is he brings an invisible purse out, puts an invisible purse down on the table. He has, uh, he goes through the whole invisible deck presentation. He then gets them to fold the card up and put it in the invisible purse. And then when he reaches into the invisible purse, 
he pulls a folded up card out and when he unfolds it, it's their card. Now the method that Wayne uses, although brilliant, doesn't really work close up to small groups as it does on stage. So uh, I've adapted it to use with uh, with Christian's index from Switch, uh, from Switch One. So what I do is I actually use this index as a wallet. It's not draped over my pocket. So uh, I bring the um, purse frame out to say that's an invisible purse and this is an invisible deck of cards. And I, uh, I, I give them the invisible deck of cards. I go through the invisible deck presentation. I get them to get somebody else to pick a card. Um, and I, I go through all of this whole thing. I go through the whole thing. So I'm at a point where they know, I know what the card is because, you know, the person said it. Um, and then I do this thing where the deck disappears and I say, now, this is, this is the moment. I'm going to fold the card in half. If I get this wrong, then I'm going to give you £10. And as I reach into my wallet, I take the wallet out, the index out. And as I open it to reach in to take the £10 out, or you can structure it so you're giving them a business card. You're going to love this so much, you're going to need my business card. As you put it away, you steal the relevant card. So now I can then just take the thing, open it up, and take out the card. So there you go. There's a few different ways of actually using an index. Those are my two favourite indexes. One isn't released yet, but it will be soon. Um, but the other one uh, you can get directly, straight away, from Vanishing Ink. Okay, so the next question is again from Sean Goff, and Sean says, loving the Netrix. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Just wondering, is your multiple card find on the Netrix yet, as I can't find it? And if not, is it coming soon? You know what? I'm filming this on Wednesday. You want a multiple card find on the Netrix? We'll make it happen. I'm filming some more stuff for the Netrix tomorrow. I will film a teaching on the multiple card find. So I'll, I'll film, I'll, I'll drop in there a live performance of me doing my multiple card find. And, and then I'll talk about all of the different ways of actually doing it, because there's a lot to think about with the multiple card find. You're gonna think about how you're gonna control the cards, you're gonna think about how you do the revelations, you're gonna, you're gonna talk about if, you know, how many cards you actually use. Uh, you, you need to think about, uh, is there gonna be an extra uh, phase, an extra revelation, like where you've predicted the cards. You know, there's so many different things to think about. So tomorrow or Friday, I will film that, I'll get it, because we're uploading again on Monday. I'll make sure that on Monday when we do the upload, uh, we include the uh, the multiple card find for you, Sean. And I will go into crazy detail on absolutely everything. I will leave no stone unturned. Because for me, the multiple card find is one of the best uh, tricks that you can do. I do it all the time, big tables and close up. And there's a, there's a lot of theory behind it as to which control to use, how many cards to use, how many cards to have selected, how you make sure that that selection procedure isn't boring, but is interesting. Um, there's a lot to think about. So let's let's do that. So I'll film that tomorrow and we'll edit it and we'll get it up for the following Monday. Okay. Okay. So the next question is from Antonio Diaz Belesteros. And Antonio says, hey, Craig, great video as always. Thank you very much. I have been doing magic with a memorized deck for a long time. So I've obviously read Juan Tamaritz's books and some uh, books on memorized stacks. However, I think I need to enlarge my mem deck repertoire. So my question is, could you tell me some books or mem decks with stack dependent tricks or others um, with more tricks for Tamaritz's stack, obviously besides forecast, thanks. Yeah, absolutely, I can go through my favorite books for you, no problem at all. Um, so my absolute favorite book of all time is the Buna Vista Shuffle Club, that's by Matt Baker. Matt Baker is one of my favorite performers of Magic with, an, uh, with a memorized deck. Go check out everything that Matt Baker does, he is brilliant. While you're at it, go check his Penguin Live out and go check his Out the Table out that came through Murphy's, both of which are brilliant. After you've done that, next thing you wanna do is check out all to a maze by Pitt Hartling. Pitt is an incredible magician and he leaves no stone unturned when it comes to um, magic with a uh, with a mem deck. Uh, he goes through this thing called the quartet system which allows you to use a memorized deck to do a four of a kind production, a name four of a kind production in a really visual way. Uh, just the quartet principle alone is worth it but the other material in there is absolutely exceptional really really good next thing you want to do is you want to go check out the latest trick that's gone on christian grace's magic monthly he showed it me at the um where did you show me he showed it me at the magic circle and blew me away with it it's brilliant it uses a mem deck um or any stack and it's really clever really really clever next thing you want you to do after that is go check out any magic by uh, any books by Patrick Redford. Patrick Redford, I think, has got two or three books on magic with stacks. Now, 
a small percentage of that magic is stack dependent and requires the use of uh, Ar Aronson stack. Uh, sorry, uh, the Redford stack, his own stack, but most of it is not stack dependent. And it's well worth checking Patrick's stuff out because his, his thoughts on memorized deck magic is brilliant. Then after that, devour anything that you can find by Simon Aronson. Simon Aronson has some fantastic thinking on mem deck magic. Now, a lot of the mem deck magic that Simon Aronson does isn't really it doesn't work for me too well because a lot of it breaks the stack up so you can't repeat but it's still well worth looking into next have a look at darwin ortiz specifically scams and fantasies and um and then his new book as well the name escapes me uh he's got a download on penguin as well with some great work with memorized decks so you want to check that out then Two books by Mike Close. The first is Workers Number Five. In Workers Number Five, um, uh, Michael put in some amazing thoughts on memorized deck magic into that, uh, including his birthday book routine and his impromptu invisible deck, both of which are brilliant. So you want to have a look at that. Uh, and then he brought out another book, uh, ebook specifically on memorized deck magic. So that's something else that you can look at. Now that should get you started. There's quite a few resources there. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff coming out all the time as a, as a kind of a shout out. Have a look at Maxim by Lloyd Barnes. I think that when it gets released, I think this is probably the best thing to happen to Memdeck Magic for as long back as I can remember. So go check out Maxim by Lloyd Barnes as well. That's all the stuff that I would suggest. If you haven't already done so, check out Forecast. Not because it's mine, but because everything that I know about Memdeck Magic and everything that I consider really awesome, I put into that project. So go check that out. And um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, so the next question is from Divshan uh, Rao. And Divshan says, hey, Craig. Hey, Divshan. Uh, what should you do if after doing a false transfer, someone says, show me the other hand? Very good question, man. Uh, first of all, kind of maybe think about working on your technique a little bit. Here's the thing. This is my thought process on, um, on this. And I'll, I'll answer your question, but in a very roundabout sort of way. Okay, so uh, have I got a coin? Uh, yes, I have. Coin. Well, it's, it's a Chinese coin, but it'll do. Okay, so um, when you're doing a coin vanish, with a coin, obviously, so when you're doing a coin vanish, right, it doesn't matter how good your technique is. You could be the greatest coin magician of all time. Uh, here's the problem. The problem is when you do the vanish of the coin, uh, what's going to happen is eventually somebody is going to ask to look at the other hand. Not because you're doing it badly, but just because logically it's the next place to look, right? So people are naturally inquisitive and they try to work things out. If you just take a coin and just make it disappear and then just leave it like that, eventually somebody is going to want to look at the other hand. They'll logically try to figure out where the coin is and they might go, show me the other hand just because um, logically they're thinking that's a place it could be. So before you get to that point, before you get to the point where somebody says, show me the other hand, you need to satisfy their curiosity. So in other words, you need to show where the coin has actually gone. So uh, if I vanish the coin and then I go, but look, it's gone down my elbow. Well, suddenly they're not going to ask where the coin is because they can see where it is. It's why flurries like, look, if I put the coin over there and make it jump over there. And if I put the coin over there and make it jump over there. And I put the coin over there and make it jump over there. And look, I'm going to put it down on the table. Look, there it is. You can't see it until I do this. And it comes back. Oh, my gosh, that's amazing. It's why this sort of thing is so popular. It's so popular because that's what's happening. You're reproducing the coin. But it doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be reproducing it with the other hand, although that's why coins behind the ear are so popular. It could be, for example, let me grab another thing here. Uh, this is the worst cup in the world for this, but I'll give you an idea. You know, it, it, you could have uh, a deck of cards, okay? And the coin is already underneath the deck of cards. So when you vanish the coin and the coin has, uh, has disappeared and you go, there you go, the coin's gone. Um, now, you, if you turn around and say, but look, it's gone right there underneath the card case. Well, now they're not going to ask to look at the other hand because you've shown it's underneath the card case, right? You've satisfied their curiosity. Uh, the other thing is you could do it as a penetration. Now, this cup is absolutely ridiculous. Um, but, you know, for example, the idea of doing this and 
having the coin go into the glass and just dropping a duplicate in. Again, it satisfies their curiosity. It's turning it from a vanish into a penetration. So um, there's that to consider, which is a very important point to consider, which is if you're getting somebody saying to you, hey, show me the other hand, um, you know, try to structure your routines in such a way that you're reproducing the coin before they actually say that. Because if you think about something like a coins across, for example, all you're doing is you're doing a vanish and a reproduction. So something like Tenkai pennies, and if you don't know, like Tenkai pennies, it's look, I've got one coin over here, one coin over here. Watch if I do this. The coin vanishes from here and appears over there. That's technically a vanish and appearance. But nobody questions where the coin is in that hand because you've already shown them where it is. It's the same with like a, um, you know, that, that sort of thing, like a, um, uh, gosh, why can I not remember the name of that? It's one of my favorite moves. I'm getting old. I really am. Gallo pitch. It's the same with a gallo pitch. Um, you know, you're not question. People aren't questioning where the coin's gone because it's already appeared. Right. So that's the first thing. Look at your routines. If you're if you have a routine where you're just vanishing a coin and then there's nothing happening to it. They might think, where's the other hand? Or, oh, uh, you know, show me the other hand. So think about how the routines are structured so that that doesn't happen, right? Um, that's, that's really an important thing. The other thing to consider is, for example, let's say I do a vanish, so the coin ends up in classic palm. If I vanish the coin, they're not going to say immediately, show me the other hand. So if you do a changeover at that point and casually flash the other hand, they're not going to ask to look at the other hand when they can see that other hand's empty. You know, so if you're if you're doing a, a routine where you go, look, the coin's vanished. Isn't that amazing? Now watch, if I take a piece of dust and squeeze and it turns into a coin, um, you're showing the other hand empty so they can see it's not there. And that's the other thing as well, actually. Um, when you think about the structure of the routine, it's not just about reproducing the coin. It's making sure that the routine is continuing to move. So if I do a retention pass and I say, look, the coin's disappeared. But not only that, look, if I take a piece of dust and I put the dust over there, can you see the dust? Look, it expands. I'm having them think about something else. So they're not thinking about searching for where that coin is because I'm continuing the presentation. I'm focusing their attention elsewhere. So that's something to take into consideration as well. Um, however, to answer the original question, which is what do you do if you get to the point? Because everything I've told you about at this point is what to, what to do to stop people from saying that. But let's say that you actually get that. You know, you, you are holding a coin in the other hand um, and somebody says, hey, show me your other hand. Well, there's a couple of different options. And the first option is, the easiest option is just to go, oh man, did you catch me? Oh my gosh, I can't believe you caught me. I thought I'd fooled you. Um, and, and just open, yeah, openly show. You know, if you're doing sleight of hand magic and, and somebody catches you, the worst thing in the world is just like trying to pretend that that's not what it is. Uh, you know, what's, you know, yeah, it's there. Well done. Do you want a medal? Congratulations. You know, here's a, here's a gold star, right? I, I had a friend once. Um, haven't seen him in years, but what he used to do is he used to uh, do a sponge ball routine. And if somebody said, hey, is the sponge ball in the other hand, he would challenge them. He would bring both hands out like this and he'd say, I bet you 20 quid. I bet you 20 quid. I bet." And he'd get really aggressive with it. And it's like, man, we're doing it. Understand why you're doing magic in the first place. You're doing it for fun, right? You're not doing it to challenge people. You're not doing it to... You know, get into arguments with people. You're doing it to share wonder to anyone that's watching you, right? So why get into a challenge situation? If somebody says, hey, the coin's in the other hand. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you caught me. That's amazing. I can't believe you caught me. Well done. I tell you what, let me see if I can try it a different way. Then go into a different presentation for it or go into a different trick. Because here's the thing. People don't know what you're going to do. They don't know what that vanish is going to, is, is going to happen. But and what's going to happen when you do that vanish? They just think that they've caught the coin in the other hand. So just go in a completely different direction. You now know that they're the sort of people that are going to try and catch you out. So you can say, well, you caught me. Yeah, you did. But to be honest, here's what I was trying to do. I was trying to make you look over here because over here, this is where the real magic is. And you just continue to flow with the presentation. Yeah, very, very important. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a few things that you can do. My advice, though, is just to not be confrontational. A lot of the time when you're doing magic and you're nice about it, if you're nice about it, no one's going to no one's going to try to catch you anyway. A lot of the time 
the uh, the only time really that people try to do that sort of stuff unless they're a very specific audience member type is if you're just being confrontational if you're not being confrontational it's not going to be an it's not going to be an issue at all you know so don't be confrontational work on your presentation work on your routining of your tricks so that that sort of thing doesn't happen and worst case scenario there, there's one more tip i can give you which is start by doing a trick that's a complete vanish so that they can see that it doesn't end in the other hand. So, for example, start off by taking a coin. And, and if you're having this trouble a lot, this is. If you're having this trouble a lot, say, guys, my name's Craig. I'm a magician. I'm going to show you a trick. And maybe you have a coin with a pull on it. Right. And you go, watch, I'm going to take the coin. It flies in there. Look, I'm going to take the coin and, and, and snap. And look, the coin vanishes. It's in the other hand. No, it's not. Ah, it's not in the other hand. Don't be silly. Are you, what, you don't trust me? That's ridiculous. Can't believe you don't trust me. Um, and so you kind of establish that you can really make a coin disappear because they're not going to ask you if it's in the other hand more than once. That's something that they think of. So maybe you highlight that. Maybe you do a really bad vanish. Maybe you use a, a shell. So let's pretend this is a shell. You show the two coins. You say, I'm going to show you something with two coins. Let me take that one coin and snap. And maybe you do a bad vanish. Look, I'm going to, I can make that coin vanish. It's in the other hand. No, it's not. I can't believe you. I can't believe you think I would cheat. You know, the trust has gone in this relationship. But now you've shown them that it's not in the other hand. So now they're not going to go back to the well more than once, right? They're going to, uh, they're going to, they're going to leave that approach alone because they've just been burnt with it. So there's a lot of different ways to, uh, to kind of handle that situation. Pick whichever one you prefer. So the next question is from Arm1E. A-R-M, numerical one, E. And uh, Ami says, uh, would it be possible to show the price of the tricks in the review show where the name of the trick comes up on screen? It can be a little frustrating seeing an awesome trick only to find it's too expensive to justify as a hobbyist, perhaps in dollars and pounds. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I have toyed around with doing that in the past. It's something I've never done because there's a lot of people who watch this channel uh, that, that, you know, buy things from different countries and different denominations so i've kind of just thought well you can very easily google it we put the descriptions uh we put in the description of the review show where you can buy the tricks from but you know what if you know if you want us to do that i have had a few people ask it before we can do that for you no problem okay so the next question is ollie extra virgin de olivia nice to meet you man uh, can you do a review show revisited with tricks rated under 50%? Yes, we are planning on doing more review show revisited soon. It's something that we've had to kind of take a break from just for a little while because they are so... It takes a long time to film them because we've, me and Ryland have got to go to uh, a place where we can film, get permission from people to film. And, and it takes a while to get that, that footage. But... Uh, we've got uh, we've got more time over the summer, so we are definitely going to be stockpiling a load of videos so that we can do more review show revisited. And I think a review show revisited with tricks, all of which we didn't particularly like, would be a really interesting concept. So yes, we will one hundred percent definitely do that. Okay, so the next question is, what's your opinions on TCC as a company, their presentation quality and products as a whole? I haven't seen much about them, to be perfectly honest. I use my TCC cases as close-up cases, and they're really good. Uh, some of their items I've seen are great. I don't know much about them. I'll be honest, I don't know much about them. Um, everything I've seen has been good. They seem to do a lot of stuff on Kickstarter, which works for them. Um, but I don't really know much about them. I mean, I'd like to find out more. All I can tell you is from a review point of view, a lot of their tricks have been good. Some not so good, but most of their tricks have been really, really good and I've been very impressed with the stuff that they've brought out. So they seem to uh, focus on quality um, and, and that's, that's always good in the industry. Okay, so the next question is from Sheep Saga and Sheep Saga says... Um, will there be any more of your older products being re-released in the future, a bit like Keymaster and Chop? Well, a lot of the stuff off Locked in a Room Without Coins and Slim has gone on to um, the Netrix. So you've got stuff like that that's already gone on to the Netrix or some of the routines, some of the best ones have gone on to the Netrix. Um, Keymaster and Chop was obviously uh, two routines that were obviously ready for an update 
uh, and, and that worked out really well. We've just obviously bought out the Mirage coin set through Alakazam, which was first released about 15 years ago. Um, a lot of people have asked me if I'll re-release the Nightshade coin set, which was another coin set I did many, many years ago with World Magic Shop. Maybe I will. That's something that maybe I could revisit. I've got no plans to do that at the moment, but it's something that could be done. I've got a lot of people asking me about Attack of the Bag and, hey, can I, uh, can I bring out Attack of the Bag again? Um, I'm currently looking into it because I want to improve it. I want to improve the gimmick. Um, the gimmick was good, but I think in 2022, I think it can be better. And I'm looking into prototypes for that. So leave it with me. It is something that I may be considering. Um, I've refilmed already the project that I did called Flipped Out. So my very first DVD was called Flipped Out and it was with World Magic Shop. And it was a teaching on the um, flipper coin. And I've, I've filmed, I don't know when it's coming out, but I filmed a project called Reflipped with Penguin Magic, which was uh, kind of a reimagining of Flipped Out with new routines and new handlings and you know, kind of a bang up to date version of what I wanted Flipped Out to be. Um, I'm also looking at kind of redoing love cards in a completely different way, which was another product I bought out years ago. I've got ways of actually redoing that to make it even better than it was before. So, um, yeah, and, and that's yeah, that's it. I mean, those are the ones I've thought of. I've been having a lot of people ask me about, um, about quarantine, but I don't think that's something that I'll ever do again. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you tell me, is there a product that you've seen in the... Ah! I'll tell you one that I am revisiting. I'm sorry. Blank. Um, blank. I love routines with blank cards. And Blank was one of my favourite DVDs that I bought out in the old days. That is getting an update. That is getting an update. And there's going to be new routines, new ideas, new concepts, new everything. So, yeah, Blank is definitely coming back uh, bigger and better than ever before. But, as I was saying, if you've seen any of my products and you think that they need updating or you think that they could come out again, please let me know. Okay, so the next question is from Johnny Coates. And Johnny says, hey, Craig, love the channel, especially the reviews and the Q&A. Thank you. I have two packs of marked cards, cohorts and knocks. Love the cohorts as they're so easy to read. Do you know any resources for marked deck tricks, specifically books or DVDs and downloads? Are there any exclusively marked deck tricks? So that's a great question. Um, and the answer is uh, very simply, I don't really do that much with a marked deck. There's a couple of routines that I do. The best place, at least in my opinion, for um, resources for routines with marked decks is the Netrix, because there's a section on the Night Flight deck. Now, the Night Flight deck is, in my opinion, probably the best um, marked deck you're ever going to see. It is really good. And the um, uh, Steve Deller does a great job on the Night Flight deck. He really does. And the marking system is brilliant. And there's so many different things that are built into them. They're great. And the originals that were plastic were so... such They serve such a good purpose for the mentalism community. And the red ones that have come out since are great. Anyway, there's a section on Netflix for night flight routines. And I've got two or three routines on there. Everything I've ever done with a marked deck. Steve Della has got some amazing routines on there. Again, all with a marked deck. So that's worth looking at. That really is worth looking at. So I would suggest... Um, going checking out the Netrix and looking at the Steve Della night flight section. Um, outside of that, um, I don't really know much more resources for tricks with a Mark deck. Um, maybe it's something that I need to look into. Maybe it's something I need to look into. Or maybe you guys that are watching this, leave a comment down below. Where's the best resource that you've found for routines with Mark decks? Okay, so the next question is from Matt Keep, and Matt says, Hey, mate, loving the channel. Thank you. Recently picked up a lot of your latest releases. I think the value for money and teachings you give are superb. Thank you. I've just ordered Mirage. I have Gossip, Keymaster, your Alakazam Coin Magic Academy, is visible, forecast, etc., etc. Man, thank you. I will certainly be keeping a lookout for the Cheeky Project. Um, but you also mentioned quite some time ago about a project involving this Bengali deck in a similar vein to what you've done with Visible. Do you think it's likely it's my favourite gimmick deck and people think it's known everywhere, but I do it a lot and maybe only 1 in 20 know it. But if you've done the same as you did with Visible, it would give more ideas for uh, people to do things. Um, where people don't even know it's a Svengali deck, much as the same as Visible. A lot of the time, people didn't know that particular deck was in play. Thank you. Right, okay, great question. Yes, the Svengali deck. Okay, so when I... Um, visible was the second trick I bought out. It was first of all Gossip, then it was Visible. 
since I've come back to the magic community. And when I spoke to the 1914, every year uh, it was intended to bring out another project on another gaff deck. So year one was visible, uh, the invisible deck. Year two is meant to be the Svengali deck. Year three is meant to be the stripper deck. Now, I wrote every routine. I put every, I, I, how I create magic when I'm looking at a particular deck is I literally just immerse myself in it for like two or three months and I'm just obsessed with nothing else but that and after Visible came out I spent so much time working on stuff with Svengali tricks I already had a bunch of routines that I was happy with but I was coming up with new ideas and new concepts I had 50 ideas and I whittled it down to 15 and these are the 15 best routines and I've been working them for the best part of a year now and they've been getting brilliant reactions um it's now up to the 1914. Like, I'm ready to film this project. So uh, it's when they're ready. I know that they've got a lot on at the moment, but when they are ready, I will be ready to film this project. Literally, the second they say ready, I will be there in a heartbeat with my Svengali deck, ready to, uh, to show you guys what I've got. And I have got some killer stuff with the Svengali deck. If you like Visible, well, put it this way, my friend Nemid Phoenix, who I check all of my stuff with, every time I come up with something, there's two people I go to to show it. Lloyd Barnes, Nemid Phoenix. And it's normally Nemid first, because he lives near me. I see him more often than Lloyd. Um, Nemid has said that this Svengali, the routines in the Svengali deck project are the best routines that I've, I've ever come up with. Better than anything else. And that, from somebody like Nemid, means an awful lot. I can't wait for people to start seeing the stuff that I've come up with with the uh, Svengali deck. So really, it's down to the 1914. You, you message them and let them know. I'm sure it'll happen at some point. They are very busy, but uh, the goal is to get it out this year. I think we can still hit that. We're only halfway through the year. So at some point this year, Svengali, hopefully, will be hitting the shelves. Okay, so the next question is Army Dude. And Army Dude has posted a link to a video that I put on online in 2018. Craig, we know what purse this is, but what's the coin set? Can it be used, can be done with your Mirage coin set? If not, where can we get this set? It's very cool and the perfect routine for us to uh, learn and use. Love it. Thank you very much, Army Dude. That is my personal handling of the two copper, one silver uh, uh, coin set, uh, otherwise known as the copper, silver, brass. Uh, the only difference with that routine, uh, that, that project, the, with the, the, coin per, the coin set I was using was made for me by Lassen. So it's a custom set. There's no Chinese coin. Instead, it's two copper coins and a silver coin. It's commonly known as uh, two copper, one silver. And it's my routine for it. It's very similar to a routine that I actually do uh, with copper, silver, brass set. So that's, that's what that trick is. Um, I've had a few people ask about it. You're not the only one. Uh, I'm doing it on uh, Netrix soon because a lot of people have this set or they have access to this set and they don't really know what to do with it. I spent a long time coming up with ideas and routines and handlings with it. So uh, it's my, my personal routine, the routine that you just saw, is going up on Netrix soon. I'm glad you like it. Uh, if you want to do it, you just need to get yourself a two copper, one silver set or a copper, silver, brass set. You can then do that exact routine. And uh, by the end of first week in August, I think it's slated for release on the Netrix. So there you go. That's where you can learn it. And that's the set that it uses. Hope that helps. Okay, so the next question is from Mike King. And Mike said, I heard you are bringing out a cheek to cheek deck project. Is this true? And where might it happen? And will it be ready for release? Yes, I've got it coming out through Alakazam Magic. Um, uh, it was filmed. I tell you what, the, the performances were shot at the same time as I shot the performances for Cheeky. The performances were shot at um, Houdini's Magic Bar. Uh, the project has been done. I have seen the final trailer. So the final trailer is done. The tutorial is done. I have sent the tutorial to my friend Nemid Phoenix to check and it is fine. Um, they have the decks because they all had to be custom made because they are gaffed in a very particular way, not just cheek to cheek. There's something else going on in there as well, but they're all done. I believe that Alakazam is just waiting for the packaging and then they'll slot me into their live launch schedule whenever that will be. Um, I'm really excited for people to see the Cheek to Cheek deck project because there is so much you can do with the Cheek to Cheek deck. If you saw me lecture at Blackpool, if you saw me lecture on my Penguin Live or at the Magic Circle or most recently at um, the session, you saw me 
talk about a couple of different things that you can actually do with a cheek to cheek deck but there's a lot more that you can do besides what i was showcasing at those lectures i'm very excited about people seeing the the power of this this set and and again i'm sorry to bring him up again but he's my sounding board uh nemed has been uh working these routines for so long now and he said to me the other day he said that um you know he wouldn't do a gig without doing two of the routines on that project and that means a lot coming from him uh because he is a real worker but yeah i'm really excited about the stuff that's on there everything's been shot i sat down with harry nardi and i did all the instructions with harry watching me it's all really easy stuff but uh, very deceptive as well. So look out for it, it's coming soon. So the next question is from Oliver Vinacore, and Oliver says, where can I find your packet trick DVD called Slim? Well, it's, it got released about 12 years ago. I don't think it's really in stock anywhere anymore. I've got my own personal copy of it, but in all honesty with you, Oliver, I took the best routines off there and I put them on the Netflix. So there's tons of routines that were on there that are now on the Netflix. So if you want to learn the material on there, Go check it out. So the next question is from Pratek Kohli. And Pratek says, hey, Craig, great Q&A. Thank you very much. I've just received Chop and Keymaster. And the teaching and quality of the gimmicks alone is unmatchable. Thank you. I have a question. Um, should a performer stick to one form of performance, i.e. mentalism, coins, cards, or should he stick to just one? In other words, be it better to be a jack of all trades or a master of one? It's really down to the individual. Yeah, you know, it's really down to the individual. Um, I like, lo I love magic. I love every single aspect about magic. I wouldn't want to limit myself to learning just one aspect of magic. I wouldn't want to limit myself to um, performing one type of magic. I love card magic. I love coin magic. I love mentalism. I love absolutely everything. I wouldn't want to limit myself and box myself into one particular area having said that there are a lot of people like paul gordon that have and have done so very successfully and paul loves card magic and because he loves card magic he doesn't feel like he's boxing himself into one particular area um, because there's so much you can do with the deck of cards really it's down to the individual do i think that people should limit themselves do i think that it's really down to the individual you know, if, if if they're passionate about one particular prop more than anything else and they want to do that, that's absolutely fine. I do think that if you learn lots of different aspects of magic, even if you don't perform those various different aspects, it makes you a better magician. So, uh, for example, the principles that you learn when you learn how to palm a coin can be applied to card magic. And it's stuff that will make your card magic better. Um, you look at stage magic, I became a much better performer of close-up magic, especially to a big group of people, like on a big table, when I learned how to do stage magic. Because what I learned about performing on stage transitions really well into the close-up environment, right? So I, I think that it makes you a better magician. One case in point is I see so many magicians that really get magicians guilt when they palm a card. When they palm a card and hold one secretly in their hand, they, they get a lot of magicians guilt. But you don't get that generally as a rule um, if you are a coin magician because the thing about coin magic is you've got to learn to hold a coin secretly in your hand. If you can do that, then palming a card isn't a problem. So really, it's down to the individual. So the next question, and again, is from Pratek Kohli. And Pratek says, uh, is it better to know and be able to perform many tricks so-so or 10 tricks brilliantly? realistic i mean that's kind of a loaded question there pratek uh realistically you want to perform every trick that you do brilliantly you don't want to go out there and perform a ton of stuff so so um and one thing that you know i, I get people on the channel turn around to me and say oh uh, you didn't perform that trick particularly well in the magic live or or it wasn't your best performance well no it's never going to be a lot of the stuff that you see me do on a magic live a lot of the newer stuff at any rate is stuff that I've I've no intention of performing to real people, but I want to perform it so you can see a live unedited performance of that trick. So there's a trick that's come out, it's not got a live unedited performance, but if I do a performance of it, then it has. Now I've learned it, but I've not worked it in in the real world, so it's not scripted, it's not been worked in. You wanna see what I perform when I perform in the real world, go check out some of the live performances from the 5x5s, five five for example. Um, 
But uh, so realistically, I think the tricks that you take out and perform in the real world, you shouldn't be performing any so-so tricks. You should be performing nothing but amazing tricks. But why limit it to 10? Why not say 20? Why not say 30? Why not say 40? Why not say 50? Why not say, hey, what's best? Is it best to perform 10 tricks brilliantly or 50 tricks brilliantly? Really, it's down to as many as you want to learn. You know, I love learning magic. I love working new material in. Um, you know, and I love taking something that I buy and I'm really passionate about and going and trying it in the real world. And I know a lot of people are scared of doing that. I've spoken to so many magicians that have had the same trick in their close up set or their bag that they take to gigs for the best part of a year. And they take it to a gig because they've practiced it at home and they're convinced they're going to do it. When they get to the gig, they don't feel confident doing it. So it stays in the bag. And that continues ad infinitum over and over again. My difference is I like taking tricks that I feel passionately about. Out, tricks that I think are really good and I will go and work them in in the real world because I really enjoy doing it but if it doesn't hit if it's not brilliant it ain't gonna stay I'll, I'll take it out I'll give it some chance to breathe and see if I can make it work but if I can't make it work it's gonna go away and I'm gonna go back to something else that I know does work so no you should never perform any tricks so so but I don't think you should limit yourself to just saying right I'm gonna do 10 tricks brilliantly and that's it you do as many as you want to do Okay, so the final question uh, from Pratek Kohli, uh, question number three, is best source to learn magic with gimmickless coins? Okay, I'm going to give you a few different sources. First of all, I may be biased, but I would say the Netrix is a brilliant resource for learning magic with own gimmick coins. There is a slight section with about 40 or 50 slights with coins. Uh, and then there's a ton of routines. Very few routines on the Netrix use gimmick coins. Most of them just use regular coins. We're just uploading another three routines at the moment onto the site that use regular coins. There are literally 50 or 60 routines that use regular coins. So the Netrix is a great place to go. Uh, the second best place to go, oh, not saying second best, but another place you can go is by looking at most of the stuff by uh, Justin Miller. Now, Justin has some great stuff on the Netflix, but you can also get some of Justin's material directly from him as well. So go check that out. Justin's one of the best coin workers in the world. You can also have a look at the... Um you can also have a look at the Metal Project by Eric Steve Eric Jones. Uh, so Eric Jones' Metal Project that came out from Illusionist and that's still available. You can go and buy that now. Uh, and then finally, the New York Coin Guys, uh, which consisted of David Roth, unfortunately no longer with us. Jeff Latter, unfortunately no longer with us. Michael Rubenstein, still here. And uh, uh, Mike Gallo, still here. Those four guys put a series of DVDs out uh, back in the day. And they were amazing DVDs full of really world-class, stunning magic. So you can go check those out. You can still get them. Uh, also, Michael Amar bought out something called the Easy to Master Co uh, Money Magic Series through l and That's now available as a download, so you can get those from most shops. Uh, and that was a great set. That's what got me interested in coin magic. Um, and yeah, that's probably the best places to start. So if you're into... Oh, also, duh. My Alakazam Academy, Volume 1 and Volume 2, I did two Alakazam Coin Magic Academies. Both of them used magic with just ungimmick regular coins. So it's worth checking those out as well. Okay, so the next question is Adrian Suter. And Adrian says, hi, Craig. Hi, Adrian. I've been very busy in my non-magical life for the last few years. Good stuff, but it's great to be back in magic. Great to have you back. I have two questions this week. First, a uh, philosophical one. Do you consider magic as an art form? Uh, as a form of art, entertainment, or education, or of competition? And how does this influence your magic? Magic is really whatever you want to get out of it, you know? Uh, for me, it's a source of income. You know, I make my living from performing magic. So for me, it's a source of income, but it's also a source of entertainment. Um, I love entertaining people. I think at its heart, magic is entertaining, right? You're not going to go... You, your goal isn't to learn a magic trick to show somebody to piss them off. Right, I really don't like this guy. I'm going to piss him off by showing him a card trick. That's never going to happen, right? So I think every magician wants their... Their, their performance to be entertaining. However, entertaining is subjective. You know, some people might find my performances entertaining. Some people might find them terrible. Some people might find Eugene Berger's storytelling style presentations entertaining. Other people might say, oh, I hate those style of presentation. It turns me off. There's no right or wrong. Magic is subjective. But I think everybody 
wants to perform magic and wants to watch magic to be entertained. You know, at the end of the day, you know, there's so many different things that we can do uh, as general public, right? There's so many different ways that we can spend our free time. You know, so if we're choosing to watch magic, it's because we want to be entertained in one context or another. So I think entertainment, yes, is a form of art. It's definitely an art form if done the right way. Um, I, you know, it just is. You know, I, and what's the right way? Again, that's subjective. You know, you might um, you might watch somebody like Mark Bennett or myself or Daniel Chard or somebody at Smoke and Mirrors in Bristol. You might go and watch that show and go, oh, that was that was entertaining, but it wasn't art. It wasn't an art form. Other people might go and go, that was an amazing theatrical experience. So again, it really much depends. It really whatever you want to get out of it competition you know you look at somebody like Woody Aragon who by the way I forgot to mention Woody back to the memorized deck question definitely check out Woody um but uh, you look at Woody Aragon when I interviewed him he was talking about how passionate he was about performing and you know there's some people that I know Mark Oberon is a perfect example he's somebody who loves uh competing not performing competing he loves entering competitions um for him that's great that's really fun uh, you know, it's why he entered FISM. You know, people get a buzz out of putting together a competition act to enter a competition. You get out of magic what you want to get out of it. Is it an education? Well, you know, there's magical historians there that track the history of magic. There's people that are members of the magic circle that don't perform magic, but they are fascinated about the history of magic. Magic is an art form, yes. Magic is entertainment, yes. Education, yes. Competition, yes, but not to everybody. It's whatever each individual person wants to get out of it. And that's really based on their agenda. And how does it influence my magic? Well, for me, first and foremost, I want my magic to be entertaining. For me, magic is secondary. The most important thing from my point of view is that I entertain the people that I'm performing for. Whether that's as a gig, whether it's on stage in front of a thousand people, whether it's at a kid's show in a village hall in front of 20 kids, whether it's at a close-up event, whatever, whether it's at a lecture in front of a bunch of magicians, I want to make my performances entertaining. Magic is the vehicle that I choose to do that. However, I would rather people leave my performances and go, that was entertaining than that was magical. Do I want them to say both? Do I want them to be blown away by the magic and also blown away uh, by how entertaining it is? Absolutely. But if I could only pick one, I'd want it to be entertained. Because if people aren't entertained and people don't find my performance entertaining, that as somebody who is basically an entertainer, I failed. Basically. So, yeah, I mean, I, how does it influence my magic? I think about every aspect and I try to think to myself, is this entertaining? If I was watching this, would I find it entertaining? And asking that question over and over again is a great way to strip back your performance and make it really streamlined. I've taken routines out of my act. I've taken lines out of my act. I've restructured a lot of what I do to make it more entertaining. Okay, so the next question is from Adrian Souter, and Adrian says, secondly, a more practical question, are there any tricks that work particularly well with a themed deck, like a Harry Potter or a Star Wars deck, where the picture cards show the movie characters? Absolutely, I find those decks of cards really awesome from a creativity point of view. On the Magic Live, if you look on the Magic Live playlist, I've inc and, and these are also on Netflix, I've included a bunch of routines using Harry Potter coins and Harry Potter playing cards. Um, sort of mem uh, uh, mentalism style routines and coin changes using these coins combined with cards uh, really makes for uh, very interesting ideas that you can actually put out there. Um, but you, you, the same applies to all of these decks. I, I find them a really great source of creativity. So I, you know, I, I, I've got a Star Wars deck and each one of them has got a different character on it. How can I use that in a trick? Uh, in a different way to a card trick so it's perceived as more than just a card trick and what props can I bring in so I'm working on something ironically with the Star Wars deck at the moment where I've got a little mini lightsaber and I've got a little mini lightsaber that they're actually using as a magic wand and the deck of cards they're picking a uh, I have them go through and I have them pick out somebody who they consider evil and they're using the lightsaber to find the person a bit like a pendulum. So, you know, allow it to help your creativity become more creative. Let it wash over you. Um, you know, I don't think there's any particular tricks. You said are the tricks that work particularly well. Well, as I say, the ones that I've put on net tricks that I put on the Magic Live playlist, you can go check those out. I'm sure I'll be adding more to the channel over time. 
Uh, but realistically, you can take any trick and adapt it to any particular um, style of deck. So, for example, if you're into Harry Potter, you know, and you've got a deck of cards uh, that are all Harry Potter themed, that's fantastic. Let's say you do a color prediction where you've got four different colors. Or let's say you've got a Rubik's Cube. You could talk about how the Rubik's Cube represents, uh, the colors on the Rubik's Cube represent the different houses from uh from Harry Potter. So the red is Gryffindor, the green is Slytherin, you know, so on and so forth. And then you combining this Rubik's Cube with the cards and you're doing something kind of special with it. I, I don't, I think a lot of the time it's looking for presentational angles, right? Taking existing tricks and using presentational tools and presentational angles to, you know, combine maybe those tricks with a particular deck of cards to create something bespoke and, and, and unique to you but if you're going to do that i think one of the most important things is you make sure that the subject in which you're trying to do it with you're passionate about you know i'm not passionate about certain subjects so i'm never going to try and create a trick around that subject because it just doesn't interest me star wars harry potter superheroes they definitely do okay so the next question is great q a here's the question and this is from mr Harmon. hey mr Harmon, what would you say makes a good magician what are the certain characteristics uh great question i think it comes back to what we were talking about earlier on i think entertainment is the key i think making it entertaining and again without laboring the point entertainment uh, is subjective you know somebody who is like Eugene Berger is a completely different style of entertainment to somebody like Greg Wilson, but different people will find them uh, entertaining. So what makes a good magician? Really, it's down to the individual and what the individual likes about magic. Uh, you know, I've been to uh, gigs in the past where somebody said, oh, I hate magic. And then they've said, oh, I like you because you're really funny. But I bet you people have seen me because I take myself not very seriously and I'm always messing around and I'm always joking around. I bet you people have seen me at gigs and they've gone, oh, I'd much rather see David Copperfield. That's what real magic's about. It's about the spectacle of that. Or maybe, oh, I'd rather have Dar Darren Brown. That's that's real magic. That's like So it's, it's really subjective. It's down to the individual. But what would I say makes a good magician? Um, I think that you need to be able to talk. I think that you need to be able to project yourself. I think you need to be able to carry yourself well. I think having an ability to ad lib is important uh, because a lot of the time you're in situations where you do have to ad lib or you have to kind of go in different directions. I think all of those characteristics are uh, are really important. I think really the best thing that magicians can do is take in acting classes and learn about vocal production, learn about ad living, learn about comedy writing or whatever it may be. But yeah, certain characteristics, vocal production um, is is very very important. The ability to carry yourself on stage, I think, is very important. The ability to you know just adapt to a situation I think is important as well so rather than being completely linear you have the ability to go in different directions depending on how things come up and again what are the best characteristics it really depends on the type of magic you're doing and the environment in which you're performing in a close-up magician requires different characteristics than a stage magician for example uh, but yeah I mean ultimately Mr Harmon that's a really good question Okay, so the final question today is from David Bond, and David Bond says, what exciting updates are coming on the Netrix? Oh, very exciting stuff. I mean, every two weeks we upload um, uh, five, five new routines, and that's been happening ever since we created the Netrix. One thing that I'm doing at the moment I think is a bit of a game changer, because one of the things that people have said to us, and me and Jack and Michael and Luke here in the marketing department of our companies, we are constantly working on improving uh, the site. For us, it's a long-term thing. We want this to be something that everybody uh, kind of really finds uh, a use for in so many different ways. Uh, we've just recently added a um, best tricks of the week section. So every week we update what the most popular downloads were that week. Um, and that's been very well received. The week before we did a coming soon page, so you knew what was coming. Uh, that was a few weeks ago now, that's really good. One thing that we're working on at the moment, and I'm almost there, and, and this is something, because one of the feedback that we've had about the Netflix is it's just overwhelming. There's so much material there, and it grows every couple of weeks. It's like, now there's more material, now there's more material. Bloody hell, right? Um, so one of the things that uh, I've been working on, and I'm really excited about this, is when somebody signs up, there's a form that they fill in, right? 
and it asks them particular questions. And the question it asks them is how long have you been into magic? Uh, what type of magic do you prefer the best? Uh, what would you say your skill level is at? And they have to answer all of these questions. Now, based on these questions, it will then the system is going to extrapolate all of that information and send them an email with a link to the best videos for them to watch initially when they first get into the platform. So when they first get into the platform, it's going to take what their likes are, what their interests are, their level is going to ask them what their goals are in terms of joining the metrics. And there's lots of different options that you pick from. And then all of this information is taken together and they get sent an email and that email will have a list of, uh, of, of courses that they need to start on first. Uh, and then it'll send them another email a week later with another bunch of stuff that they need to watch after they've watched the first lot. And the reason for that is we find, as I say, when people get into the net tricks, it's overload. What am I going to learn first? Oh my God, there's so much really good material. So it's a way of actually improving the user experience. Anybody who knows um, um, that I, you know, I'm very passionate about business, one of the things I'm passionate about is the customer journey and trying to make sure that the customer journey is as strong as possible. And in this case, the customer journey is really important. And, and that starts right from when they first get in the platform. So if I can give them a little bit of guidance and push them in the right direction uh, when they first get here uh, and, and push them towards courses that I think they'll really like, then uh, I think that's going to give them some. Um, I think that's going to give them some um, some motivation to then uh, watch those before going on to other on, on other courses. So I've been working on that for about a month and a half now, and I'm almost there. It's all been put together inside a platform called Keep, and it's all, oh my god! If you saw the logic inside this, it's like right. If this happens, go here. If this happens, go here. I've had to write over 450 separate emails with links in each one, and I'm almost there. Uh, and then when it's finished, it's going to be sent out to everybody in the metrics that's already in there, and then it's going to be automatically sent to everybody when they uh, when they sign up as well. So that's one thing that we've been working on. Uh, another thing that we've been working on, oh, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you, but there's so much stuff. We've been filming this massive cube uh, course at the moment we've got that we want to have like a really cool uh, section in there on, on routines with cubes and so on and so forth there's just a lot going on in there and I am really happy and proud of what my team have managed to accomplish with the Netrix I really am um, blown away in fact by all of the different aspects that we've managed to pull together so uh, yeah uh, if you're not a member yet please join because uh, the best is yet to come so there you go, guys. That's another Q&A in the bag. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Now, you want to see more videos like this, like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below. If you haven't already gone so, please check out The Netrix, www.thenetrix.com. Go check it out and see what all the fuss is about. And I will be back again later on tonight. Now, I've got a couple of things happening later on. There's a Magic Live at 6 o'clock for sure, standard. 9 o'clock tonight, I've got a special review show special uh, and it's on a new book that Vanishing Inc. have just bought out. They've just bought out on Friday. They dropped 52, um, uh, the new, uh, Jack Parker's new book. If you've seen 52 Memories, it's one of the best books ever written. Uh, 52 Explorations is the follow-up book. Uh, Jack Parker, unfortunately, isn't with us anymore, but the material in this book is golden. And there's also an interview with Andy Gladwin talking about the book and talking about Jack Parker. That's going to be at nine o'clock tonight. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you again soon right here on Magic TV. Mm -hmm.